This superb plane was really a modification of the SR-71 Blackbird, capable of carrying missiles within an internal weapons bay. Only three examples of the YF-12 were produced, the design being used only in a reconnaissance role. By the late 1960s, the United States found itself clearly in the market for a new fighter. Some time previously, the McDonnell Company had been developing designs to fill the high-performance fighter role. Some would have variable geometry of the wings, and some utilize new shapes. But by 1969, they had settled on a basic design which walked away with the Air Force Experimental Fighter Competition, with an order for 20 F-15s going to McDonnell on the 1st of January 1970. By the time the F-15 project was underway, the company had merged with one of its competitors to become the giant McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell was a relative newcomer to the aviation business. Established just three months before the outbreak of World War II, it used more of its wartime capacity to make parts and sub-assemblies for other aircraft companies. Poetically enough, among them was Douglas, which by that time was a well-established aircraft manufacturer, producing planes from the 1920s onwards. However, McDonnell Aviation, although a much smaller company, quickly gained a good reputation for reliability under the leadership of its founder, James McDonnell. Mr. Mack believed heavily in the team spirit, and this clearly gave results when it came to production. The first plane that McDonnell produced of their own was the XP-67, nicknamed the Bat. Only one example of this advanced design was ever produced, and this was to crash during its test period. But this rare film shows the concept was years ahead of its time, utilising a fuselage that blended completely with wing and engine nacelles. Thirty years later, well into the jet age, this concept was to become almost standard. But in 1940, some considered it too revolutionary. The BAT also had provision for placing jet engines behind two props, again clearly reflecting the advanced thinking of the fledgling St. Louis Aircraft Company. Although the BAT did not proceed, the team that had conceived it obviously impressed the military. McDonald's operation grew and they moved the plant to the edge of Lambert Field, which gave them access to a substantial runway. The company was determined to stay at the forefront of the new technology that was emerging in the post-war years. Technology that involved the jet engine that had quickly taken over from piston engines and new designs using much better material than was ever available during the war years. But still, bringing them together with the company's philosophy of a team approach to problems producing a design team that quickly won the respect of the military and competitors alike. These men are inspecting an F-101 Voodoo, a plane that would be a major success story for McDonnell, but, like many of its aircraft, a product of perseverance and commitment to an idea rather than being built to a strictly confining government specification. As the 50s came and went, McDonnell survived, manufacturing exclusively to fill American military requirements. McDonnell's biggest success came with the development of the F-4 Phantom II. Like many of their other planes, conceived as a Navy fighter, but its versatility soon made it the standard fighter for all three of the American Air Arms, 
the only plane ever to do so. Now the St. Louis plant was to produce a new shape. The F-15 design would be subjected to the most critical tests of any aircraft and templates and models were made to confirm the concept's viability. Slowly the prototype began being pieced together like a huge three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Testing and refining still continued as the plane evolved. Here a prototype is seen in the paint shop in the last stages of production. The Air Force officer in charge of the F-15 project gives his thoughts on the team effort. I have never seen a finer joint government industry team that's organized with the technical competence to carry out the job that's been assigned to them or to do it in a manner of close-knit teamwork. Before an invited audience, the first F-15 was rolled out on the 26th of June, 1972. I christen the eagle and may you reign supreme in your domain. Hear, yeah, hear. Yeah. The Eagle's raised canopy gives it the best field of vision of any fighter since the Sabre. Since the first Eagles would only have one pilot, that man would have to have the best vision available. Seen here is the Eagles' variable air intakes, a truly sophisticated feature which allows its computer to optimize the air supply for any angle of attack. This massive air brake running down the aircraft's spine not only slows the plane, but makes it more maneuverable in certain circumstances. Being conceived from the outset as an air superiority fighter, provisions were made for built-in cannon, something the early Phantoms had been designed without. But for normal attack, the medium-range Sparrow missile, a development of those used over Vietnam, was to be carried two abreast each side of the plane's engine. The four Sparrows would be supplemented by four more Sidewinder missiles, shown here on the outside, used for short-range attack when the cannon was not suitable. Fully armed, the F-15 Eagle was a truly potent aircraft, which it was hoped could counter anything the Soviets could produce. Its distinctive twin fins sit each side of the complex jet exhaust and give the aircraft increased stability at high speed and allow the pilot maximum control of the aircraft if it were to lose an engine in flight. All in all, McDonnell and the Air Force thought the Eagle would be the answer to fighter needs for years to come. But this was yet to be proven and for the aircraft's first flight it was shipped to Edwards Air Force Base. the complex jet exhausts, sometimes known as turkey feathers, adjust as the engine starts for a ground test prior to its first flight. In case of brake failure, the plane is securely moored to the runway for the static engine test series.
When the technicians are satisfied, the pilot, Irv Burrows, makes his inspection. You can get some indication of the aircraft's immense size as he walks up under the wing. With so much at stake, he's understandably cautious. <laughs> 